Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope you're all appropriately wined, dined, and refreshed and ready for the next session uh, of the New York Times Art Leaders Network. I'm really grateful that uh, Oliver Eliasson has given his time to speak with us today. Uh, Oliver is a, a Danish Icelandic um, artist, obviously, but he has been based here in Berlin since 1990. And he has a studio which is based here which uh, employs 120 people. The topic that we're going to talk about today is art through technology. And I wanted to begin by asking you, Olafur, you know, the, the people who are working with you, they're architects, they're engineers, and they're craftsmen. How integral is technology to the work of your studio? Well, almost everything in the, flues, in the studio is influenced by computers nowadays. The artists uh, who, work there, who are, work with computers, the architects are trained on computers. So, it's hard to imagine running the studio without technology, so to speak. But also, the studio has an active archive. We have a small TV station called SOE TV. And we have a number of things going on in the research which are related to um, technology, such as uh, playing with VR. Uh, and we're very active on the social media. And it turns out that, um, for instance, the home page, when we finally got around to check how many people actually visit the home page. There's more people visiting the home page than going to the exhibitions. And so some years ago, we took the home page much more serious, realizing, my god, this is a space. This is a way to have a dialogue with people that is otherwise not really appreciated. So gradually, we have become incredibly influenced by technology. I think the social media element of what you do is really interesting. You have loads of followers on Instagram. Even the kitchen of your studio has 7,000 Instagram uh, followers. And through your use of social media, you're able to reach a really vast audience. But are all those people going to come and see your shows, or does that not matter to you? It is actually interesting because uh, it turns out that once uh, I have an opening in a country, I would post that on social media. Uh, and uh, that is, by the way, uh, Instagram uh, Studio Olaf Eliasson. Very easy. Go check it out. But, but so, and then on the opening itself, you suddenly have people where you can say, wow, this was probably not people who got an invitation, but they're here anyway, and it's very exciting. So about we try to calculate a little bit what is roughly the amount of people who comes through the social media, and who are they? It's about 30%, as far as I could tell. And these people are not necessarily art professionals. Uh, and it is an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, opportunity to see that the art world actually is very easily, um, how should I say, broadened or spread out a bit. Because obviously, it's quite exciting to have people come to an opening or come to see a show, which we're not necessarily going to make it otherwise. We were talking before in another panel about Yayoi Kusama, and uh, David Zverna was talking about the way that uh, she has used um, social media, and other people have used her work in social media. And she's also a highly Instagrammable artist, as, uh, as you are. And I, I mean, I don't mean to suggest that cynically, as in you uh, sort of use it, uh, you design your works around it. But some artists are more Instagrammable than others, I would, uh, I would think. And what do you think about, say, like a painter or a, a sculptor or so, someone whose work doesn't have that same kind of uh, social media impact? Do you think that for them, social media can be as useful as it is for you? Well, I think it's a little more complex because what I think we are seeing is a general trend also in museums and institutions. There is a democratization of art, and, and I think that's a very healthy movement. Within that movement, there is the role of social media. And then you're right, then there are stuff that is more exciting to look at on a tiny little screen than others. I think people are smart enough to evaluate that this is not necessarily a quality, art quality indicator. Being so, uh, Instagram friendly does not, you know, uh, validi validify, uh, validify quality, but it does, I think, open up the opportunity to kind of say, well, the social media, besides on one side being a challenge, it is also an opportunity. And for me, I mean, now I have an exhibition at the Red Brick Art Museum in Beijing. Every day there's 3,000 uh, people coming to the show, and the average age is 27. And it's, a gen it's gender even. There's uh, e equally uh, uh, girls and boys. So it's, it's very interesting. And then I've been talking to the uh, press and the education people. Who are these people and how do they know the show? Because I'm not that exposed in China. It's all through Weibo. So clearly, we have a problem where is that 
is the quality of the experience actually really sophisticated enough, right? Is it, is it, is it numb? And my argument is, well, maybe it's the first visit, maybe through the next, the third visit, gradually they will investigate or get more involved and become more Im immersively involved with art. So I really welcome this idea that there's a lot of people coming to the exhibition and they are not necessarily the typical professional art goer. In your studio, do you have social media managers? Do you um, seek to influence people's behavior on social media or do you just put it out there and see what happens? Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, so I have a research team, which is uh, 25 people. In that team, we do communication, text editing, we do small films, we have a film team, a VR team, uh, uh, we have two, I think, th two or three computer programmers. So we are very you, active. Are you actually trying, are you sort of encouraging people to share these things? Are you, is that the kind of behaviors that they're trying to promote, this team? What do you mean? So I tell, no, so it basically works like this. We keep looking for ways to talk to people through, the, for instance, the social media, which would optimize the, the relationship with the art, mm -hmm. which means you can use social media to kind of be counterproductive, counterproductive to the quality of the exhibition. You can also use social media to give the backstory, the back, the context, kind of try to optimize the sophistication and the intimacy of what does it then actually mean to look at art. And I think, in that, there is also the, the, the way we look at who are the people who come to the museum, do we see, or to the exhibitions, do we see them as consumers who are passive, or do we see them as active producers? Do we believe in empowering people, or essentially also decentralizing the authority that we all have? This is then the authority room, right? So it's very interesting, the opportunity in, in the social media also has to do with decentralization of who owns the experience? Who owns the artwork? And that, so, so obviously museums being, generally speaking, very afraid of uh, letting go, I mean, of the narrative of the show. If done rightly, and this is what we're working on the team, how can we actually empower the visitor to be very strong in creating an, a, 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 their own narrative? So I see, I mean, I, I totally get that it, it can be incredibly counterproductive to see people walking through my work with a phone like this all the time. But we, I also see that maybe we are going through a period where eventually people are going to use this as a learning opportunity to do this, right? And, and, and uh, I hope. What, what about the role of brands in this? Because anyone who has a big social media following like yourself becomes attractive to brands, particularly if they want to reach younger uh, a younger audience. And when we were at dinner last night, you were saying that your, your kids' sort of attitude to your art is generally a bit of eye rolling, oh great dad. But when you said you were doing something with Louis Vuitton, then they were, thought that was really cool. How do you think that brands can be involved in an artist's social media uh, presence or in the life of an artist generally in a way that can be productive for the artist and not just for the brand? Oh, this is complex. Yeah, my kids are clearly spoiled, but the, po <laughs> the, point, is, the point is though, I think that there is a great benefit in, in a very strong uh, public sector collaborating and involved in art and a very strong private sector commitment in art. So I would welcome the kind of triangulation of, you could say, the cultural sector and within that also the philanthropic effort, right, the collectors and so on. And then you have the kind of private sector like Louis Vuitton who is very involved with art and then you have public, like basically the, the kind of public system where we, so, where we suffer a bit from from uh, uh, populism and the general, you know, the whole sort of polarization as such. And suddenly the cultural sector might offer a platform through which we can have trust being generated. So I think, I mean, at the end of the day, what the big brands are looking for is obviously trust from their co customers. And, and I'm happy to see that there's a lot of private sector and public sector interest in saying, wow, art enjoys civic trust, surprisingly. Obviously, the financial sector has been very bumpy and, and self, uh, uh, sort of egoistic, you would call it, right? And the public sector is also struggling. But the cultural sector, I mean, look at this room, right? Besides it's being primarily old white guys, but besides that, it's not so bad. It was, there's a lot of power in this room. So what we need to do is to see, well, how do we actually um, take, make, make leverage on the cultural sector and use the civic trust that we enjoy and go against populism and phobies and, and all the challenges that we see. We're just not so good at working together yet. And maybe the social media, that's why I'm so interested in this idea, 
of the decentralization of the authorship, I think it's very healthy for, for, for you to kind of let go a little bit and say, okay, maybe the viewer or the user of art, if you want, maybe they actually have the answer to what to do with social media in the museum. Maybe it's that, obviously, we have to be sophisticated, we have to do science, we have to not forget art history, need to be totally uh, uh, you know, precise. That's not what I'm talking about, but we should also show some respect to the people who make the effort to come to the museum, maybe for the first time because of an Instagram. And in a way, it's amazing. We just need to then say, okay, you made it to the museum, now let's show you how amazing art can be. Uh, I think we've time for one or two questions from the floor. Here's a question for Olafur. Uh, this lady here. There's a microphone coming for you. Yes, hello. Does it work? I was wondering, so we're talking about technology and about marketing and about social media. How does this influence you as an artist in the sense that it might distract you from your initial instinct being an artist? So I think but, that Sorry, can I just, I'm sorry, I had a, a second one. Can I meet you for an interview in your studio one day? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so, so, so I don't think that, so I'm interested in perception, immersive, psychology, the experience, all very analog things. So the technology platform has given me a new space. So the museum has all these spaces. Now there's a new space called this. So it doesn't change my interest in psychology. It just gives me another space. So I'm very involved with VR, for instance. And I'm very involved with a company called Acute Art, which I think will be the best uh, VR platform for art in, in, in sort of VR. And I'm totally convinced this is going to be amazing. So I'm putting a lot of effort in that. But it does not change that fundamentally I'm interested in my body, movement, architecture, psychology, immersive experience, you know, losing myself, finding myself, and the criticality around that. So, so I don't see that it's, no, technology is not content, it's form. Like, it, it is a place for me to walk into to amplify something that I wouldn't other, otherwise be able to uh, amplify. I think we have time for one more question. Is there anyone else with a question for? Olafur? No, in that case, I'll ask you a bit more about, about what you're doing with VR, because of course that famously requires specific technology in order to make it work. How do you think, that, uh, how do you think that's going to live on social media, or will that be a totally separate thing? Well, we all know what Spotify did to the music industry, right? So I'm not going to be gloomy here, but interestingly, imagine if you could have access to artworks on your sort of going through you know, some platform like Netflix or something, you, with your VR headset. So anyway, so I'm just saying, I think so much will change. It doesn't mean that suddenly we're not going to have the classical gallery with the painting on the wall. It just means that there is a new space out there where a lot of more people will have access to artistic experience. And we know VR has this whole motoric immersive quality. And the quality of the glasses, even in the three years I've been working with it now, is getting so intensely much better all the time. So could you imagine a future in which people in their own private homes are experiencing VR artworks there? Yeah, very easily. But, uh, but I, what I think is probably not going to be a chunky thing on your head. Maybe it's just something like, like here, right? And maybe it's something that if you do like this, it goes away. And do you know what I mean? So I think uh, we are just seeing the stone age of a new interface. Oliver Elias, and I look very much forward to uh, experiencing whatever it is that you do with this uh, technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>